Okay, sorry about that. Hopefully, can you hear that first part? Okay, I'm speaking from my heart now, and so because I was raised in this home, as I described, I started trying to kill the pain of not being loved correctly because we're all designed to receive love and what I was receiving was just an experience that didn't look like love didn't feel like love was just being managed housed fed schooled I didn't know who I was and nobody was speaking into my life telling me that I was worthy of being loved and I started trying to prove that I was somebody that could be loved by being in relationships, getting girlfriends, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Because when I would convince someone to to be my friend and to let me be in a relationship with them, then it, it kind of defeated the lie that I was no good or something was wrong with me. But that would only last for a little while and then I'd have to get another fix by getting another girlfriend and it just went on and on and on. Using people to prove to myself that I was worthy or that I was lovable. But there was the inner pain, so I started using drugs to kill the pain. Smoking marijuana at first when I was 14. Started using alcohol whenever started using drugs, other drugs. I think the first one after marijuana was LSD. I'd be tripping at school, tripping at home. And then other things. PCP, Angel Dust, so whatever drugs were available, mushrooms, hash, like, I would try it all. And when I couldn't get that, I was sniffing glue, sniffing gas. That was crazy. Anything I could get my hands on. And I was high every day for over 20 years yeah I mean I couldn't when I was in the army in boot camp of course but the as soon as we got free from their control we went straight to the px and started getting drunk and so alcohol heavily when it was in the army and then drugs and introduced to heroin and i got turns out by shearing needles i contracted each uh Hepatitis C, 
and didn't find out until 20 years later. It had destroyed my part of my liver and And God healed me of that. That was one of my first obvious healings was being radically healed from hepatitis C. Um, but anyway, I was using, using, I met my first wife when I was 16 and we got married. She was pregnant at 18. I joined the army, and that was weird because my dad never taught us go to work every day, but he did go to work every day, and and that was a value, a high value that I saw in him. Like he never missed work, and he never let drinking get in the way of providing for us. So. Here I am, 19, newly married. I have a job, an apartment, a new baby. And I got drunk on Sunday night, so drunk that I couldn't go to work on Monday. And I missed, missed work. And I just was like, something's wrong with me. I need help. I need discipline, like I'm out of control and I won't be able to support my family this way. I can't build a life if I can't control, you know, if I can't go to work every day, I won't be able to manage it. So I went straight to the recruiter on Monday afternoon after I felt well enough and joined the army thinking that I would get disciplined. And so I, April 1st, 1975, April Fool's Day, I enlisted, or I went, I was inducted into the Army as a infantry soldier and went to boot camp in Louisiana, Fort Polk, Louisiana, for four months. Normally, Boot camp is eight weeks, but because I was an infantryman, we stayed with the same drill sergeant for 16 weeks. And it was, it was brutal and disciplining and hard, and, but I got through it. And then I was stationed in Fort Lewis, Washington for the remainder of the time I was in the service. Um, I made it one year and 10 months. And then I was discharged for drugs. They gave me an honorable discharge. Uh, they called it a drug rehab failure. I had went through inpatient treatment. I had been using angel dust and marijuana and they detect or I had gotten so high on angel dust I couldn't go to work. I turned myself in. They put me in rehab. I met a guy who was a heroin addict and he introduced me to heroin and it just, I had to get out of there. So I told him I just can't stop and their program doesn't work and I need to get out of the army and away from it. And that's what I did. They, they said okay and let me go. And we went back to civilian life. And my wife and I tried to tried to pick up the pieces and make something, and it just didn't work. I was still a horrible person to her and mistreated her and I was so jealous because of my infidelities I was projecting on her and accusing her and was in fights all the time and 
No, I was a soldier, you know, I could, I was more <laughs> equipped to inflict more damage on people and finally it was over and I met this girl, she came to a party at my house and we decided to hook up and went to Arizona and for five months and my daughter stayed with my first wife and I was at work one day and she said your Melissa Missy wants to know when you're coming home and just so my heart just exploded that I had left her behind and it wasn't that great there it wasn't that fun it was fun at times but it was just pointless you know and the only thing that really mattered was her is what I was feeling and I I left that day I went home I told the girl that I'm leaving if she wanted to come she could come but I'm going home and went back and she came with me and it just got worse and worse and we finally I had to break it off and I met my wife Meg and we started putting our life together she had been married before and had a son and I had my daughter Melissa and we try to try to manage and I tried to be good as far as putting a roof over their heads and going to work every day and and Meg is just an amazing woman and she she protected them from me as best she could but Finally, she had enough, and she told me to leave, and so I thought that drinking was the problem, and so I left and quit drinking. For, I was, we were apart for 10 weeks the first time, and I quit. She saw that I had quit, and she decided to give me a chance, and I moved back home, and now I'm sober. This is 1988, so for two years, I was just mean and hurting and sober. <laughs> And we did, we found out that drinking wasn't the problem. Drinking was a was a symptom of a problem. And now the problem is exposed. There's something wrong with me, and I need help. So she she threw me out again for being abusive with my words. I never touched her. She would have killed me if I touched her. <laughs> that sounds funny, but it's not funny. It's awesome that she's that strong and set really good boundaries, but not good enough, I guess. So the second time my daughter and I moved out and we were apart from Meg and I were apart for a year. And during that year is when I got saved. You know, I wanted my marriage to work and I didn't know how to fix the problem. I didn't even know what the problem was. I, I knew what the symptoms were. I'm angry all the time. I'm hurtful. I'm just a a-hole and didn't know why 
So I went to the counselor. It was just, it was a Lutheran services, you know. It wasn't Christian counseling, but it was a Christian organization. And the guy who was a counselor knew my older brothers. So there was a connection and, you know, our conversations were a little different than they might have been otherwise, but more real, I guess, because we were, you know, there was a connection. And he was a, he was a person who had gotten sober, you know, he had been an alcoholic and he knew what was going on. So he, you know, I told him I'm something wrong with me. I don't know what it is. I need help. Can you help me? Excuse me. And he said, well, you need to do the 12 steps. And I had been through two treatment programs. One when I was 17. And they threw me out of there and for Actually, I got thrown out at two when I was 17. One for using drugs and one for fraternizing with the other patients. And then the drug program that the Army had, you know, I successfully completed 30 days, but I never stopped using. So I had been exposed to the 12 steps and the, how they work and... I'd seen people that had been transformed by walking the steps. and So I believed in the program, but I didn't believe in God. And I told him that. You know, I said, I can't do the first steps because they involve God, you know. And I wasn't an atheist, I was an agnostic. Because I had, you know, God is everywhere and songs and books and stories and people's believing and but I didn't know him and the the I wasn't going to commit to a program where the key player is somebody that I didn't know and so he said well Skip the first steps and go to the fourth step. And, you know, the first steps are first to, to, to agree that your life is unmanageable and that you can't fix it. I had that one. And then two, to believe in God. And then he has the power to help you. And then the third step is to make a decision to let him help you. And then the fourth step is to confess all that you've done. And the fifth step is is to actually confess, you know, fourth is to write it down, and then the fifth is to share it with God and to someone else. And then you go on to the rest that clean up the mess that you made. And so I, he said, write down what you did. A fearless moral inventory. And don't leave anything out. He said, we're cleaning the slate. We're, we're purging the, the history. We're erasing. So don't leave anything out. Because if you leave anything in because you're afraid to share it, it'll just come back even worse because there won't be any other weeds in the garden. And so that picture was in my head when I was writing and I confessed everything and, and it was long list, you know, I was being thorough and I was being honest and there's things that I've done in in the secret that I'm ashamed of. I still haven't told people except this guy, and God knows. I mean, 
I'll confess adultery and, and, you know, stealing and lying and things like that, but there's worse things where, you know, we have a code of ethics built into our DNA and I violated my own code and, and I wrote it down. And so when I did this, and then I looked at it, read it back to myself, I had a sense of foreboding. Like, this is just too horrible. Like, I had let it get too far. And I didn't deserve to be helped. I should be punished. I should be killed and it felt like I was dying I felt like I couldn't breathe and there was this heaviness and I was like a deer in the headlights I didn't know what to do <coughs> and I couldn't live with myself it felt like I was dying deservedly because I had never felt guilty not for a second for what I was doing. I'd always made excuses and blamed others. And if you only knew, then you'd understand. But here, here I am stuck with no way out. And so I, all of a sudden it popped in my head, the fifth step, that's the way out is to do the next step. So I went to the phone to call the guy and tell him everything. And I was at work. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, January 5th, 1990. I remember it because it's a day that I can never forget. I was desperate. And God helped me. Help me. He saved me. So I called him up, planning to tell him, but then I couldn't tell him because of what I had done. It was just too much shame involved. And so I hung up, and then the, the, the heaviness got heavier. And so I called him back, and I hung up again. Now I don't have any more money for the phone. And I'm just checking the time, sorry. So I went back in my truck and I was crying and I was sad and I was hurting and I and I thought, well maybe God maybe God. So I got out of the truck and I got on my knees and I put the notebook in the ground. And I was crying and the tears were dripping on the pages and in this heaviness and and I and I cried out, you know, God, are you there? Can you help me with this? And all of a sudden the heaviness lifted. It was just like magical. It was like I could breathe. I was free. And then heat, there was so much heat. I thought somebody had turned a spotlight on me. I had my eyes closed and I opened my eyes to see who had turned on a light or where the light was coming from, but there was no light, just heat. And I just was washed and cleansed and healed and convinced. <laughs> Like I knew that God was real all of a sudden because he touched me with his love and forgiveness. And and I, just, there, I had my eyes open because I was looking for the light. And a guy was walking by, an old black man who worked there. And I was so excited I couldn't help myself. I ran to him and I shook him and I said, God is real. 
And when you talk, he hears you. And I was crying. Tears of joy now. And he was a believer. He, pra he praised the Lord for what I was saying. And, and then later that night at lunchtime in the cafeteria at work, he told me about Jesus and the cross. Because I had never, I'd gone to church as a child and up to like five years old. And when I tried to picture Jesus in my head at that time, what I saw was coloring book Jesus, you know, because we would color him and I would color him all goofy colors, you know, purple robes and yellow skin and red hair and so when he was saying the word Jesus, that image, coloring book Jesus, will come to my mind. And I was just skeptical. I was like, coloring book Jesus never saved nobody. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So I didn't receive it then. But I went home and I, we were separated. I was told a friend what had happened. A fellow drug user. Who, who had been to church, who was raised in a Christian home, but was not walking according to the light. He told me, you should go to church. When that happens to a guy, he should go to church, you know. And I'm like, I don't know anything about church. And uh, he said, well, I went to this Elmbrook Church one time, and it wasn't bad. I liked the speaker, Stuart. So I went there, and the first chance I got, and it was on the weekend when they do business, you know, vote in elders and stuff like that, and talk about money, and I was, and I was like, I hate church. But I went back the next week, and then he gave a sermon. That was pretty cool. And, and then I turned on the Christian radio station. At work, I started listening to sermons. Jim Dobson. And all these well-known Christian speakers. And, and I, you know, I heard the gospel, the cross, the all the details of how to get saved and prayed the prayer and got baptized and started started going to church and being a Christian because no God was real and things got a lot better really fast Okay, I'm not I'm gonna stop here and then start again. This is getting a little long for one message. So.